in here. Um, so, you know, I kind of just want to open it up really to you and have a conversation, uh, Lorimer, um, you know, perhaps, uh, perhaps a good place to start might be um, just what, what got you curious? You've been in this field for mm -hmm. 25, 30 years. And um, I did hear that story as a young physiotherapist of um, the man that came into the ER with the, the hammer in his neck with basically no pain. And that seemed to spark something in you that, you know, can you just, can you summarize your whole career in like the next five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, I, I guess the, um, yeah, the, the guy with a hammer in his neck was a, was one of, I, I think lots of, lots of really striking moments in my, I guess, in my career, I've had those striking moments in my life. I think that, um, when when you I, I get asked this sort of question quite a lot and mm. it, it all it's it whenever I get asked it I have a new reflection and I think oh maybe that was part of part of my own personal journey but I guess if I went back uh really as far as I have with those reflections I think that uh that sort of the the perfect storm of influence on on me as an individual you know from my from my home family as a as a boy in middle class public servant laid in Canberra in Australia, uh, where it was very clear in our family in our family that values about uh, equality and uh, the human experience and people on the edges and all that so it was was really an important part of how our family worked. And I think I can see that thread uh, mm -hmm. because when I became a, a physio, I was immediately attracted towards the the group of patients that I was seeing uh, who, you know, they were, they were pretty much on the edges and, mm. and not being believed, really. I think that's the thing that really struck me that here was someone and uh, I've always been fascinated by humans. I, really, I, I think humans are fascinating. I think I'm one of the more fascinating humans to me. <laughs> <laughs> I often find myself thinking, man, why did I say that? Or, right. <laughs> why, why did I think that? Um, <laughs> Fascinating in a necessarily positive way, but really intriguing. Uh, but, you know, I've always been fascinated by humans and, and uh, I could see these people are in real trouble you know, and yeah. really suffering with, with life limiting and, and in some times threatening, life threatening pain. Mm -hmm. But the system in which I was a part, this is in the, in the early 1990s, did, just didn't believe them or would put their hands up and say, well, it's nothing we can be done. You know, there's nothing on your scan with a sort of con condemnating phrase about it. So I think there were those experiences. And then actually my first, my first career pathway wasn't in health, that was in sport. And I got injured quite badly and had uh, probably eight or nine years of, of, lower back and leg pain as a result of that, that uh, led me to do a physiotherapy degree. And I remember just being gobsmacked. Do you have that, do you have that word gobsmacked? Yes, we, we know gobsmacked. Yep. Yeah. You know gobsmacked. <laughs> sure. So I, I remember being gobsmacked by the, the stuff that I was learning in, in my degree about the biology of the human, like how, how do humans work to our best of our understanding. And I found that stuff just cool. Just, mm. just so exciting and uh, not incredible. Like it was, it was credible, but it was just so amazing the the capacity of the human over generations, but also within a life to to work. And it's an incredibly yeah. complex system, and I that stuff really turned me on. Yeah. Uh, and part of it was the hope that it brought me as a as a person whose life was. Uh, impacted reasonably heavily by pain mm -hmm. and then I'll go into the clinical classes in my course and I would this is where I was gobsmacked by thinking but are you guys not learning this stuff in the other mm -hmm. lecture room like the, the the treatments that we were being taught to deliver seem to not embrace any of that complexity and not much of its possibility uh, and a whole lot of pathology thinking 
Uh, and so I think when I, when I first started working as a physio, I was all, I was already ripe for this combination of, of people whose needs were not being met by our healthcare system. Uh, my own fascination with the remarkable complexity of the human mm -hmm. uh, and pain is a, you know, is such an experience, you know, it's something we, we can all relate to, uh, mm -hmm. And it's so individual. Yeah. Uh, and the only way we can understand it, I think, is by learning from, from people in the experience. You know, like I don't think it's the only way we can learn about pain, but the only way we can learn about someone's experience is to ask them. Right. Uh, about right. Because we can't get in there. We can't, you know, wouldn't that be great if we had this method of actually getting inside someone else's lived experience and seeing what it's like? Right, uh, right. And I try and do that as a natural tendency in my clinical interactions. I you know, often, when I talk with students, I, I talk about this metaphor of uh, rather than having a, a patient in front of you, you sort of sit next to them and just feel what it's like in their clothes and what that bench feels like. And, you know, it, it, you look at someone, it seems like they just, it's just raining on top of them and the rest of the sky is blue. Mm -hmm. uh, you can understand what the rain feels like a bit better if somehow you you can sit in the rain puddle with them and you know feel yeah, that yeah uh, and I'd love to be able to do that somehow but <laughs> I, I don't have a way to do that uh, so I guess the most obvious pathway for me was to learn how to do the best sort of knowledge accumulation we can do which was the science science right. is is a tried and true method of improving our understanding. And uh, I, you know, for the last, as you say, the last, it's actually 23 years since I started my PhD, which is okay. when I made that shift. So it was a long winded answer to your question of how I sort of got here, but I think it was a mix of, in, in the true fashion of pain, it was a mix of all the complexity that is me and my life, I think. Right. Well, I, I think, you know, yeah, just uh, it, it really shows in how you, um, you know, that that curiosity to understand humans and also being one of the really one of the top scientists probably in the world in pain science, but still staying, staying so connected with people that you can be here with us today. So, I, I, you know, I think it really that background just seems to it makes a lot of sense um yeah cool so. cool I, I uh i can't let we have a phrase here let something go through to the keeper which uh is a cricket phrase so cricket okay. for you north americans cricket is a little bit like baseball for really clever people <laughs> <laughs> that's not true that's not true um but we have this phrase you know don't want to let something go through to the keeper which means you 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 decide not to hit it and it goes through to a position called the wicket keeper like the backstop type person uh, so I can't let let the statement you may go through to the keeper about me being, you know, possibly one of the top pain scientists. There are there there are mm. exceptional scientists working away with doing amazing things that, you know, I I would be privileged to to sweep the floor of the lab for. Right. Uh, right. But I I guess I can accept your implication that I'm I'm really committed. Uh, and really enjoy and am really challenged by and rewarded by the challenge of translating the truly exciting and, and hope-filled discoveries of mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I contribute in some way to those discoveries, but, but the excitement of, of getting it into a form that's usable and accurate, uh, yeah. it's a real challenge, like... Uh, it's, it's great, Madeline, that you think I'm good at it. Uh, I feel like I'm getting better at it, um, but we've got a long way to go. It's really yeah. challenging information. Yeah, and it seems to be changing all, all the time, like from where you started, even, you know, in the 10 years that I've kind of been, uh, you know, mucking around in this field, uh, there seems, it seems to be also, in, even in the last two years, a very exciting time to... Um, to be in the, in the area of pain science and what that can, we'll get around to this probably towards the end, but what it actually means for people now in who, who live with persistent pain compared to 
you know, where you, where you were 20, 30 years ago. Um, I think that's right. I think, uh, I mean, from my perspective, the last probably five years, uh, I feel like I've been back on a, on a much steeper learning curve and uh, the, for the first time really in, in well-controlled clinical studies, we're starting to get glimpses of, of you know, truly effective interventions that, uh, that combine some of the developments over the last 20 years. And it might, that might sound like a really dodgy statement um, do you have dodgy as well? Yeah, we have dodgy. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, dodgy. Uh, it might sound like a dodgy statement to say for the first time, truly impressive treatments. But the context of that statement is the way that we test it. So we test it in these randomized clinical trials, which have to be very controlled mm -hmm. uh, and in chronic pain, seldom do they detect a much of a treatment effect and my understanding of why that happens is because in in clinical trials we just there's so much complexity that goes that, that gets mm -hmm. squashed into both the treatment you're interested in and the other treatment that the specific bit you're testing is hard to see amongst all the noise yeah right right that makes sense and uh that's starting to change and that's really really exciting and uh, and i have uh, i've just seen too too many too many people whose lives are transformed by uh, an understanding and an implementation of new things based on that understanding um mm -hmm. for me to not be primarily defined by hope i think mm -hmm. not not ridiculous hope like mm -hmm. scientifically informed realistic hope mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, yeah, so what, you know, that kind of brings me to what you have, what you have found. I know it's, you know, it seems to me that there are so many ways of, of kind of coming at this now, but in terms of, for the people that are, are here, some of the, some of the key concepts, I mean, I know you were one of the, the, I took the explain pain and I do, you know, we do use some of, we try to provide a, um, a good pain education program through, through the clinic. Um, and that seems to be a key part of it, but could, could you give us an idea of what the kind of the key concepts are that you're, that you're coming up with that, um, that seem to help people in their recovery yeah. journey? Like what are the things? Great. Love the question. Love, and I didn't even ask you to ask that question. No, um, I wasn't planning. What, what I love about the question <laughs> is, is that we have to say at the moment, what are they at the moment? Because they are changing uh, and our work in that area is being more and more informed by a, a lot of sci scientific discovery from, for, from 50 years that we haven't, you know, to, to our embarrassment, I think, we haven't been sufficiently informed about because oh. it's been outside of our field, you know, sort of uh, educational science and a few other fields but the answer to that question at the moment uh mm -hmm. is uh is summarized to some extent well there's probably two things that are coming together at the moment that are, that excite me but one of them was published in a journal called pain very recently and the the first author uh is someone called Haley leak mm. who's one of my phd well, i don't know her she's a phd student in our group in our research group, and she's actually on this edition of Australian Survivor. Oh, oh is that, is that cool. true? Yeah, it's very wow. cool. So we're all watching Australian Survivor at the moment to see how Haley goes. Oh, um, that's fantastic. hilarious! But yeah, so so uh, her paper is, uh, I think, captures some of the reason that that I'm more excited than I have been for a little while, and that is that we have been focusing for the last decade on getting a deep understanding of the perspectives of people who, who have transformed their life from highly disabled chronic pain sufferers um, who have managed to turn it around uh, and 
uh, are, re are recovered. Um, and these are people on average with uh, about nine years on average of chronic debilitating pain with, with every diagnosis you can think of, except a stroke, uh, mm -hmm. active cancer and uh, yeah, progressive, progressive nasty disease like motor neuron disease or something like that. But aside okay. from that, every it, the groups are uh, chronic pain, back pain, fibromyalgia, carpal tunnel, neck pain, abdominal pain, right. pelvic pain. And we asked these people over the last 10 years, we've said to these people who have recovered, what do you think is the most important thing you learnt? What were the most important things you learned that facilitated your recovery? So that process has been happening and that's now involved about 350 people. Okay. Uh, and Haley's study is the last part of that journey where she's taken a very formal approach to understanding what do people who have recovered from pain or, or improved value um, in learning. So that informs what I'm mm. about to say. Another thing that informs what I'm about to say uh, is us taking uh, the what we understood to be the most powerful concepts um, that had come out of this process. So we had we had eleven things that we called target concepts. Okay. Uh, and we took them to an advertising guru and said, if you had to sell this, what would you do? Oh. Yeah. They did a lot of market research and messaging and got their team onto it and have distilled all of that down into four concepts that I'm now calling, as of three weeks ago, oh. the cornerstone concepts. Okay, so this is hot and off the Everything press. sort of fits into them. Yeah, so this is not even published. Um, okay. But it is the basis of uh, education strategies that are and resources that are being developed now. Um, but the four cornerstone concepts that I would say sit uh, sit on sit on top of everything else and seem to be ubiquitously applicable. Is that does that phrase make sense? I think yeah. so. Yeah, like the four they concepts are. that in I love the way this study sounds. Like it was kind of in retrospect, what did people see as being valuable in their recovery? Like these exactly. people are really interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing to me that we, as scientists, we spend so much time getting data from and about people who are not recovering. Yeah. So little time getting it from people who are or have. Um, and that, so our, our research group spends a lot of time um, engaging with, with consumers from both sides of that people who are still in trouble, how are we not meeting your needs, that sort of problem solving, but then people who are no longer in trouble, how did that happen? How, how did you do so it? So we're, we're all question. on the edge of our seats wondering what the... Well, okay, the four <laughs> cornerstone concepts are, uh, number one is that pain protects us and promotes healing. Uh, the... And then, and there's a whole lot of other concepts that fit into that, right? So we don't expect anyone to hear that and think, okay, I accept it and understand that. So yeah. you, you, I believe you have to really understand enough to believe it in your belly mm. that pain is protecting you. Every single occurrence of pain mm -hmm. is a protective feeling. And in the normal, the, the, the beauty of evolution has meant that pain promotes healing. Mm -hmm. So when you are injured, your, your settings for everything just ramp up straight away right. uh, so that you can't move that body part because it hurts too much right. to, to move it. So pain is, is preventing the mechanical forces or possibly the temperature changes maybe, but primarily the mechanical forces from from exceeding that tissue's strength at the moment. Right. So that's normally how it works. You know, if you break your arm, it hurts to do anything at all with your arm. Yeah. It serves that purpose of immobilizing 
the bone. Right. The so day. you don't so, move it. It's, it can be allowed to exactly. heal. And yeah, there's yeah, exactly. a purpose and, to that. And modern medicine does that by plaster cast or right. in some in some situations, actual pins and things that are inserted onto bone. But if we were to apply that principle to a ligament mm. or a muscle uh, or some skin or, you know, the ligaments that make up your the structures between your vertebra that people call discs, but they're mm -hmm. not at all like discs. Mm. They're just so unlike discs. But all that stuff, pain, the pain system ramps right up. So pain protects us and promotes healing. The second one is that persisting pain mm -hmm. overprotects us and prevents recovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we know that the longer you have pain, the more protective your pain system becomes. So anyone thinking about this at the moment on the spot, you could ask questions like, uh, is the, uh, are the things that I can, the range of things that I can do reducing Mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. If they are, then your system's becoming more protective. Do things that used to hurt a bit hurt a lot? The answer is yes, then you become, it's becoming overprotective. Is the pain spreading? So it might have started in a nice discreet area of your low back, but now it's your whole low back or it's gone up your back or down your leg. Yeah. Or changes from day to day or... Exactly. So they're all signs and, and you know, we there's a consistent range of, of symptoms and signs that we would say, okay, so your system is being overprotective. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's preventing recovery. Right. Because you can't recover if it hurts too much to give the tissues the very things they need yeah. to return yeah. to normal. And that's the difficulty, uh, so, isn't it? Like when your your pain is yeah. ramping up, it's just so natural for a person to think they're they're damaging themselves or things are getting worse. But it, yeah. what you're saying is that the pain system is uh, becoming overly protective. Yeah. Yeah, so a metaphor that uh, we, we've had a lot of success with is if you imagine that you go, uh, you want to go to a lookout on top of a very large cliff, very high cliff, uh, hopefully someone has put a fence at the top of the cliff. And that fence is normally, you know, maybe a metre or two away from the edge. Yeah? Yeah. And, and that fence stops you from getting to the edge. So that's, that fence is protecting you. And we can imagine that that's like pain, which normally protects you from injury. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if you are injured, that fence rapidly moves further away from the cliff edge. So you can't get anywhere near the cliff edge. You can't even right. see the view. That makes sense. Yeah. So then normally as the tissue heals and recovers, then the fence slowly moves closer and closer back to its resting Okay. Level. So that's like pain getting closer and then going back to its normal protective function. Sure. Everything's, as we would say, tickety boo. We right? have that too. Good. Tickety boo. Yeah. yeah. In persisting pain, changes within your biology mean that the fence is slowly moving further and further away from the cliff. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that you have this really growing area of things that are actually safe but you are being protected from doing them by pain right that's, that makes sense and that's a real yeah. challenge because of course you don't want to do these things because they're painful and actually if you the, the consequence of that is that the tissues do become slowly weaker and less healthy and all that sort yeah. of stuff so it would be crazy to uh, decide, oh, okay, I've just got a big buffer. I'll go and run a marathon. Yeah. That, that would be a really bad decision. Right. So the first one is pain protects us and promotes healing. The second one is persisting pain over protects us. We have this, the buffer is just way too big yeah. and that prevents recovery. The third one is that many factors influence every pain. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there is no such thing as a pain that has a single cause. To okay, it. I just want you to. I just want people mm. to hear what you just said. That yeah, there's this many, is many where many we're factors. getting confronting. Yeah, yeah. many and factors 
influence pain. Mm-hmm. Or and the, and the next point, which is the confronting point. So now, hopefully, there will be some people online who are who, when I say this again, will be a bit annoyed, or uh, you know, maybe right. you know that's not true for me. Uh, and that is that there is no such thing as a pain that has a single cause. Mm-hmm. And normally, if I was in a clinical interaction here, one of these people online would be able to say to me, "Well, that's not true. When I broke my arm." my arm hurt and my Mm -hmm. response to that would be uh yeah but if if you broke an arm that was no longer attached to your body in some weird badly planned experiment Mm -hmm. would the arm have pain and and the answer to that question is is no an arm can't make pain right it has to be part of you as a human right then you you have horrible pain You need your brain. You actually need your entire organism Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, to have pain. And that means that uh, whether or not you have pain is not only determined by the state of the tissue. It's determined by your brain's evaluation of a whole lot of things. So this is where the learning journey requires effort. It really does require effort from the person in pain because to understand this and to change your understanding right is it's not straightforward it's a hard it's a hard thing to do but the only person who can do it is is the owner of the body and the yeah. experiencer of the pain so we spend more time now in our clinical interactions encouraging people to understand you have to learn this like yeah you can't just read a book you can't just uh, swallow a pill or get an injection. You, this concept is challenging, but so far, almost everyone, aside from someone who might have a, a, a substantial cognitive impairment, mm-hmm. almost everyone can learn this and can learn that through experience and through seeking out good information, doing little experiments with themselves, but also applying strategies that we know improve learning. Mm-hmm. For example, watching this, watching this YouTube or whatever you're doing with it, watching this webinar several times and writing down where the challenging part is and mm-hmm. watching that several times and then trying to explain it to someone else. And, and the people online will think, will experience, this is hard work. You know, I need to study to learn this. Right. But what we're finding is that when people do put in that hard work and remain curious and open, yeah, uh, that's when transformation seems to happen. And that's it's never fast. Yeah. It's seldom yeah. fast. Uh, anyway, so that's the third one. So we've got pain protects us and promotes healing. Persisting pain overprotects us and prevents recovery. Third one is many factors influence pain. And the fourth one is therefore... There are many things anyone can do to change their own pain yeah. and to retrain the system, to retrain that buffer. So for us, the way that we approach chronic pain is this is all about retraining your protective buffer to get the fence back closer to the cliff. Right. So that way more things you're able to do again and you're completely yeah. safe doing those things. Mm-hmm. I really so like that cliff analogy. Body and brain. Yeah. Yeah, the cliff analogy is great, isn't it? I'm working mm-hmm. with some um, reality, virtual reality producers at the moment who have been producing these immersive educational experiences. And they use this, this experience of being near a cliff and it's, it's really compelling. Like mm-hmm. you're in the goggles and you're suddenly standing on the edge of a cliff and you immediately know, whoa, step back. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you've got a fence there in your virtual world, and that and the fence can can move. And I've just seen someone here. What about fear of heights? Yeah, so the the health professional uh, working these virtual reality goggles would would very much need to know if this person's at risk of a major panic attack, panic being attack yeah. virtually on the edge of a cliff. Yes, yeah, so it's a good point. Whoever raised that, to the, it's an excellent point. Yeah, but yeah, I think so that's, they're, they're that's the, the trick. Like the, to um, 
Well, I think I hear I hear some really good news there that, you know, that we we, you know, with the right, perhaps the right information and working hard at it, that we all have the ability to 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 influence our pain somehow. But I the <clears throat> moving towards the fence or towards the cliff, like to make that um, I love your suggestion about watching the webinar a few times, seeing where you kind of get a little bit triggered, like, yeah, I'm not too sure about that. And moving yeah. towards that, that thing is almost like moving towards the fence. Mm -hmm. Like, what is that thing that, yeah. uh, that barrier? Um, but this is the hard thing, isn't it? When you, when, say for someone who has had like chronic back pain for 20 years and it's gotten worse and it hurts more in the morning and they're doing less and their world is getting smaller and smaller. Um, I can imagine them hearing that a few times. Okay. I'm hearing it. I'm, you know, I'm kind of believing it, but then to make that step towards the fence, that, that sounds like a critical turning point there. Yeah, it, it, it is a critical turning point. Uh, and I think the second thing, the second cornerstone concept is, is critical to understand before the third one. Because what, and the second one is that persisting pain is overprotective. So that person that you're describing, uh, they are becoming so protected that mm. their system is making their back hurt possibly before they get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, when, right. when their back, what their back needs and all of our, our structure needs mechanical forces. Mm -hmm. that, that so movement they, or they need movement and they need weight bearing uh, and they're the things that that trigger what in my view is is just a glorious inbuilt capacity for change mm. so we also mm -hmm. talk a lot about this the, the goldilocks principle uh, and you know the goldilocks story where she went in and one bed was too hard and one bed was too soft but one was just right and one bowl right. of porridge was too small. One bowl of porridge was too big, but one bowl of porridge was just right. Uh, and she had to find that sweet spot. Mm. And that principle, we call it uh, bioplasticity, which, which just means some people might have heard of neuroplasticity, which mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. idea that the brain can change. Bioplasticity is the idea that everything in the body can change and it, it can, and it's, it's amazing. It, mm. Like the examples of how these things change are, are amazing from, from people who, uh, you know, as a five-year-old have had half of their brain removed. Yeah. Still managed to be functional human right. adults to experiments mm. like experiments that I've been involved with, where if you get a rubber band uh, and a little device and you exercise once every hour, you know, exercise like this against the rubber band uh, in three weeks, the structure of the bones in your finger have, has changed all the lines of strength within those bones mm. because you've been doing that right. in three weeks. I just it's think that's incredible. amazing. Mm -hmm. incredible. You cut yourself. I, I cut my finger. You know, I won't be able to show you on this, but I cut my finger quite a long time ago uh, badly when a glass fell out of a cupboard and cut open. And I could see the tendon as I move my finger, I can see the tendon moving and part of me, I'm just so fascinated with, with all these beautiful biological things. But one thing I did notice that when I would, I'd straighten my finger out for a while and I, I could hold it straight in a, uh, like in a brace for one hour. And then when I bent it, the tissue, had, the skin had already started connecting itself back again. It already healing. From the moment the moment you were cut, your Amazing. body is like every, all this. Everybody's gathering to heal. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. an irresistible force, right? I, I'm I'm amazed that we don't yeah. make more of this in healthcare. That's an irresistible force. You yeah. cannot stand in the way of healing. It it will yeah. it will heal. It may not be like it was, right? But yeah. I've got a little scar on my finger, but my finger works fine. Uh, so this irresistible force of healing yeah. is something that I'm amazed we don't have posters on the wall about this. To remind us, it's, yeah. It's so amazing. Yeah. And anyway, the bioplasticity sweet spot is about how can we deliver a, a challenge 
to ourselves. That might be the tissue, it might be our thoughts, it might be our beliefs, it might be our behaviours, it might be our relationships, it might be locations, a challenge mm -hmm. uh, that is big enough to, to trigger the inbuilt irresistible force of change and adaptation, but is not so big that it triggers the flare-up. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately is the challenge. So when you turn, when, when you, people are thinking, okay, how do I start moving towards the fence? That's when you work with your healthcare professional with the best of your knowledge to know, okay, how far can I, can I progress this today yeah. where I know I'm not going to flare up, but it's far enough to trigger an adaptation because once you trigger that adaptation, like an athlete training for the Olympics, mm -hmm. it, the trigger will work. You will adapt. The, the really frustrating aspect of persisting pain is that that buffer can be so big the sweet spot is very small mm -hmm. and it can be hard to find and you, mm -hmm. you can overdo it and flare up, but at least you know that when you're flaring up, that's protective. It's not a sign you've damaged tissue. It's a sign that your system is saying, no, no, that's a bit close. Right. Yes. Yeah. And you haven't done further thinking. damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So when you say like, uh, you know, to, to move to, to ch find a challenge, you mean, are you you're talking about um, like just a movement, like some type of movement towards uh, something that, um, that almost provokes or stresses the body a bit? Uh, I, I am, but not only that, <clears throat> not only that. So uh, I, I think I saw before we started the protector meter. Did I see yes, that? the protector meter, yeah, and I don't know if you guys remember the people that are here. Uh, we've referred and used the the protectometer. We call it over here. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it would be protectometer. <laughs> protectometer. Yeah. Um, and your 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 dims and your sims. I just wanted to kind of trigger that for people that know know those terms. Is that yeah what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah. So we apply that principle, the Goldilocks principle, to all the dims and sims. So. The, the first phase would be, okay, identify all the dims. So for those people who don't mm -hmm. understand what that means, it stands for danger in me. And that can okay. come from everywhere, any, anywhere in your life, because we, when it comes to pain, everything matters. Mm -hmm. Everything potentially matters. And if there is any threat to a system that's already got a big buffer, any threat at all, Mm -hmm. will modify the buffer in real term, in, in real time, real time. So uh, in a normal nervous system with a normal protective setting for a body part, uh, a, a COVID pandemic is probably not enough to make your knee hurt, right? But in a, in a sensitized system where your whole biology is now overprotecting your knee, then the presence of a COVID pandemic may well make your knee hurt more right? because the right. system is so attuned to threats mm -hmm. from everywhere. So with, with the dim sim balance idea, uh, the first step we encourage people to think about is to look hard for dims mm -hmm. because they hide in hard to find places. Uh, and that and can any be dims... yeah. anything you eat, anything you see or hear or think or people or, uh, you know, relatives, family <laughs> and yeah. just being really really honest about that like yeah yeah know, and, and what's in your life you can see why that third concept is really critical because if you if you don't understand that many factors influence pain then you'll have no i mean it, it could even be insulting that someone would suggest to you that you should consider your relationships when it comes to your pain yeah it could be insulting yeah. if you if you think your pain is purely uh, about a tissue that's damaged in, in, for example, your back, mm -hmm. then a health professional suggesting oh, how your relationships might be insulting to you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, or uh, your thinking or mm -hmm. your emotions. Uh, I can yeah, see definitely. the importance of moving, uh, you know, very um, sensitively through those steps for people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And, and always trying to sit on the park bench in the rain. Yeah. You know, what would it be like? What would it be like hearing this? When, when the last 20 health professionals I saw told me I've got the, the back of an 80 year old and I've got this problem and that problem. And now there's this new information that 
if you if you if you can't get your head around the modern science of pain, then it's easy to misunderstand what a health professional who's talking the talk, like like contemporary, yeah. evidence based, scientifically grounded stuff. They might say something that that you hear as, I don't think you're legitimate. Yeah, I think yeah. You're making this up. I think you. I think this is all in your head. You might hear this stuff, even if the health professional is delivering current. Yeah. Oh, we got some freezing scientifically going on. based, go. evidence based stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, and and then we have to consider that most health professionals, all health professionals, are not perfect in their understanding and delivery of this. So we do have the risk of misunderstandings. And yeah, so I think you do have to go slowly. Um, so then, so we identify all the dims we can remove. And for the dims that we can't remove, then I would apply this Goldilocks principle to all of that. You know, so you, you might recognize that, well, if I, I'm in this job, I'm returning back to that job, for example, and my boss is a dickhead, mm -hmm. but you can't remove your boss. So can you, can you plan a graded exposure to your boss where you get that challenge? So it's exactly the same as a movement or an activity, yeah. but it's exposure to that dim and that person is the dim. Right. Can you strategize about that? And can you make sure that when you do expose yourself to the boss, it's not on the same day that you do the vacuuming and that you get in touch with your tax accountant? Or something like right. that. Yeah. Like to really think broadly about all the dims. And can you plan your week so that you don't put all the dims on one day? Yeah. Yeah. To not overload your, your system. Um, well, yeah. Because every, every dim will make the that buffer go. Mm. Right. Yeah. And just mm. loud, get louder. Yeah. That, that's yeah. interesting. Which means just more pain, more readily produced. Right. Because we, we focused a lot on, on the physical dims, on, on how people can, you know, graded return to their activity. But I really like what you're saying about identifying all the other dims, because we sometimes forget just how important they are too. We talk about them, but that graded exposure to them is, is really important as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, and it's challenging, isn't it, Mark? Because uh, sometimes people who are in this journey, and this is quite common in my conversations with recovered people, people who've recovered from chronic pain, they, they describe moments in their recovery journey when they recognised a dim that was very difficult to accept and to engage with and mm -hmm. required a, a whole new understanding of adaptation and uh, yeah, and I guess yeah. resilience. Mm. Yeah, wow. And sometimes I imagine some, um, well, just in, you know, in our work with the dims and the sims, sometimes some very big lifestyle changes. Um, those, yeah. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we have, um, you know, we really have, I think, addressed quite well slowly over time. And people, I don't know, the people here can let me know if this is true or not. Um, looking at thinking and emotions in terms of dims and sims. And right now the class we have going through the summer is an, an emotional um, awareness class. And so I, I'm curious if you've noticed this, like when we talk about dims and sims now, I, I see that it's becoming more and more generally, um, maybe not for everyone, but more generally accepted because Often people will, will um, well, uh, will often notice right away. Oh yes, that's you know that definitely you know turns up the volume. That turns that turns it down. Are you noticing that becoming more accepted in the conversations around pain? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I I think that I'm noticing that more that change, I'm, I'm noticing that change more in conversations with health professionals. Uh, I'm, in conversations mm -hmm. with people in trouble with pain, they have a lived experience of some of those connections often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but the health system hasn't provided a framework and 
I would argue, a, a safe place to voice that and to take on the challenge of what that means. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, for every health professional that uh, we engage with or know who is completely comfortable with the idea that everything matters when it comes to pain, that your system is dynamic, that it changes, all that sort of stuff, there'll be another at least one health professional who is stuck in the dark ages. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm noticing it becoming more accepted within the healthcare community over time. Um, but I, I can also see it happen, it happening for consumers who I think are now getting that message from more than one place. Uh huh. Now, yeah, I it's think they're supported. getting it from it's... all places. Yeah, yeah and that's how validated. that's how progress works, isn't it? Like it, it wasn't that long ago that to uh, have a a knee replacement, you know, was an outrageous proposition. But slowly, as the evidence built and more successful stories and science mm -hmm. tells us things and the clinical trials are done and slowly all of the healthcare professionals get up with the program, then it seems like, well, it was always the thing you did for right. this situation. And I think we're in that process and it, it feels very slow to some of us. I don't know if you guys mm -hmm. feel like that. You think this is so slow. Mm -hmm. But if you think, like in my own field of physiotherapy, uh, less than 20 years ago, uh, the idea that focusing on understanding and empowerment and resourcing consumers would be a core part of physiotherapy practice that, that w was laughed out of the World Congress on Physiotherapy. And that was less than 20 years ago. Yeah. So yeah. actually, and physiotherapists, I would argue, are uh, at the... At the leading edge of this way of thinking and, and treating. Yeah. So that's in many ways, that's a very rapid transition and I'm excited to think about. So in, I imagine in another 20 years, it'll be like, well, of course we consider all these things when people's pain is not resolving as quickly as we thought it was. Yeah. Thought it should be. Yeah. I can see, I can see that, like that shift happening just, you know, um, now it seems so much more um, of, uh, uh, it, well, for the people that have joined in, you know, all our Zoom webinars over the last um, year, um, you know, it seems so much more normal to become a participant in your own recovery and start doing these things for your for yourself and starting to notice a shift and a change, which is really exciting. Um, yeah, I agree. And I mean, I, I think, you know, that idea of, of being upfront with consumers to say, okay, our plan here is that you're in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. You need to drive this vehicle towards recovery. And that means you need to learn how to drive and you need to understand the road rules and you need to, uh, and all that's all stuff I can help you with. You know, I can help you with resources for your mm -hmm. journey. Uh, but one of the added benefits of, of this sort of empowerment enablement approach is that when this is over and you've got the life you want, you'll have other major challenges in life. You mm -hmm. know, you, you're going to be older. And as you get older, there's more chance of things going wrong in life. Uh, and you will now have a whole new set of skills and understanding with which to negotiate that when it arrives. Right. And I think that's a great fringe benefit or extra extra benefit. And as long as we're in a model where where we as health professionals, you know, deliver care and treat, then when the episode's over, this, these people are no better off than they mm. were before it started. But in in contemporary pain care not only do people uh, negotiate a, a challenge, it's absolutely challenging, long, potentially long journey back to the life they want, but they're not the same person. Mm. Mm. They, they were before this all started. They're changed. They've got <laughs> new resources, new understanding. They sometimes have new friends. And <laughs> yeah. All sorts of stuff. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. But you, but those tools of like, say, whether it's, you know, whether it's breathing or mindfulness or pain uh, um, information about pain or, you know, skills they learn through a cognitive behavioral program are skills that can apply to any life circumstance. Absolutely. And this, this yeah. one being the hardest probably. Yeah, I think so. One, definitely it's up there, isn't it? As mm -hmm. uh, we wrote a paper in a, in a political journal some time ago called Chronic Pain, The Difficult Problem in Healthcare, because I think it, it really is. It's one of those, uh, you know, truly complex system mm -hmm. and individual affected things. So, yeah, maybe it is one of the most challenging health journeys someone can have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lorma, I want to, I would, I don't, I've had a like, couple of questions that were submitted. Um, if I can kind of just squeeze into at the end here as we're drawing our, our talk to a, a close, um, if that's okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I have one that um, we often see people who feel a lot of shame around, around their pain. And what would you say to those patients who are feeling a lot of self-blame and shame um, because it seems to make it difficult to move towards um, a path of self-care, recovery, and well-being. Yeah, uh, I think I think of the um, a sort of internal states or internal perspectives that I come across dealing with people in in pain. I think that I think shame is for me it's one of the most tragic. I think. Um, mm -hmm because the oh, I believe there's, there's never anything to be ashamed about, but I, I don't I don't see that as, as uh, therefore you know snap out of your shame or anything like that. I, yeah. uh, I guess the uh, I haven't met anyone in chronic pain for whom their pain is not a a uh, an overreaction of a system that's out, it's outside of control. No one ever sets out to have chronic pain. Yeah. No, no one ever sets out for that. No. But the mix of uh, right from genetics, the, the balance of molecules in someone's body, right up to the world in which they live and the time in which they live, all mm -hmm. of those things interact in a way that we, you know, we 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 just have no, as a rule, no awareness of, and very little control over, uh, until we have that understanding. And I guess that brings me back just to iterate the last point that once you understand the system differently, then you're better equipped for future challenges. I think that's mm -hmm. it's a really it's really worth iterating. But uh, what do I? How do I engage with that scenario? Mm. Uh, I. I think I accept it and say, that must be horrible to feel that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. How well do you understand that? Mm -hmm. And how, how do you think that's impacting on your, your choices moving forward? And how can I assist you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, them. I, yeah, I totally get it. I, you know, I don't think I've, and I've, you know, I don't see too many patients who would articulate that clearly. That yeah. I'm ashamed, but they, they I get that impression from them. Right. And normally it, it's like, I mean, it's like nearly all shame, isn't it? That it's, it's actually been put on you by someone else. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not because you have anything to be ashamed of. It's that someone's tried to shirk mm -hmm. or something or, or the system, you're owning responsibility for something that maybe wasn't yours or, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I'm no shame expert at all. I think that's um, a good point, though. You know, when people haven't been believed, it, it does become this internal, um, you know, experience of feeling ashamed that they, uh, but I want people to hear that too, what you said, like, no, like, I don't, yeah. I know we all know that, but nobody asks to be in pain, that it's not your, your fault, you know, this kind of perfect storm of, um, you know, of factors that came together and your hopeful message that there, there are ways that we can start to, as you say, move towards um, the fence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, I really, uh, I'd, I think we could get better at 
as health professionals at uh, as a group at avoiding the shame like, mm-hmm. uh, like the way we the way we talk the terms we use the facial expressions that we have when internally we might be thinking oh this is going to be so hard right and i don't know but what it to com- do comes across as this guy this this guy's a lunatic and it's not at all what's going on inside mm-hmm. but there's this you know we have to be more careful about the dims yeah. that we deliver in yeah. the course of our of our work uh, and you know, I think also, I don't know if, if shame and embarrassment are different or I guess they I are. Think but so. I find people can, who, who are embarrassed about, even when they learn some of this stuff, they, they're then embarrassed that they haven't been able to learn and implement this. Mm. Um, and I think that failing is with us. Mm. You know, we've got to get better at it. Some of the more powerful data that's come through our group, our research group, is an audit study where we we now have data from 1,500 uh, consumers with chronic pain, uh, all of whom participated in this, these data are collected over 10 years, I think, from a few places, but they've all participated in specific educational interventions okay. based on what I reckon is has been the best approaches we've had, although that's rapidly changing, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, all of them were trained by me, so that makes me think, oh, well, I'm, I'm a pretty good trainer. <laughs> right. I must <laughs> yada, know that. Uh, and of those 1,500, about half learn the things we want them to learn. Um, 50%. And Yeah. And the 50% who learn it have great outcomes. So that's the really exciting bit, like like seriously great outcomes. Okay. Over the year, a year later. Is that but the is that sobering, the explain pain program or is that something different? Uh, it's uh, it's not there's not really an explain pain program that I okay. know of, but it's it's an educational intervention within a range of contexts. So some of it was in pain management programs, some in corner shop physiotherapy practices. Right, but okay. all de- all aiming at these learning objectives that have been changing over time, okay. but through an ex- explanation learning interaction, if you like. Right. But early days, it was delivery of a lecture. Mm. You know, that's how naive I was, and and the field probably was. Uh, but the the exciting bit is that when people learn these concepts deep in their belly, yeah. twelve months later the average outcomes are, are truly excellent, truly excellent. Mm-hmm. You know, That's average really pain encouraging. Yeah. going from six out of 10 to one out of 10. So yeah, yeah. over a year. That's really encouraging. Yeah. But for the other half who don't learn, they are, they plateaued. They, they basically don't change. So that's the very exciting, the exciting bit is that learning is associated, seems to be associated with great outcomes. The sobering bit is that, even the good educators have historically got a hit rate of about 50%. And the, we can't differentiate those 50% according to their educational attainment or okay. any of those sort of things. So it's not, it's not about the consumer. It's about the, the, the educational experience not achieving the learning objectives for whatever reason. And that's a complex question. But that's where we've focused our attention since we became aware of those data okay yeah that's um well look forward to hearing what you know as the as we um as the research comes out on that um there's a couple of questions coming coming in um are you are uh, how much time do we have another five minutes or are yeah, we... we've got another six minutes for me another six minutes okay um <laughs> <laughs> I wonder about adding in top-down approaches. And this sounds like Mark kind of the trauma part of it, somatic experiencing, hypnotherapy, tapping, etc. I can really only talk of those things you've mentioned about uh, trauma-informed practice. Mm. I think trauma-informed practice is is important for all of us as healthcare professionals because of DIMS, basically, like even even little things like are there two ways to get out of this room yeah can affect someone's neural 
set point and immune set point, um, which is a whole other exciting area of how the immune system plays its role in real time. Um, the I don't know about tapping, but hip, hypnotic suggestion, hypnotic techniques, uh, we've done a bit of work in that and uh, I'm relying pretty heavily on conversations with Mark Jensen from University of Washington in what I'm about to say. And that is that, you know, good education is very informed by hypnotic practice and suggestions. Um, hypnotherapy, it all, I think it all depends. There's a, there's a, a, a decent body of evidence to suggest that hypnotherapy that's focused on uh, the condition of the body mm. or uh, or outdated models of how pain works, uh, that sort of hypnotherapy doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. work. Um, but contemporary, you know, contemporary science and the science of pain with, con with, hypnotic techniques should be good but i don't think there's any compelling evidence for that there is one study out of brazil that combined um like explaining pain with hypnotic approaches okay. we've done one pilot study here uh brian pulling and tasha stanton ran a pilot study here that was very encouraging uh but we haven't managed to get funding for the big clinical trial of that right Okay. Yeah. So it's well, like, thank you. No, it's like it's a little bit like saying, "Does physiotherapy work?" Yeah. Well, physiotherapy based on outdated models doesn't. Um, hypnotherapy based on outdated models probably doesn't. And I don't know what I don't know about tapping. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank. Thank you for that. That is a whole. Uh, if the, it's it's quite a, such a complex field that we could go in mm. so many different directions. Um, very last question. Uh, do you, do you feel um, for people that perhaps have, they may or may not have trauma, but ha have identified themselves as highly sensitive people from the get-go, is there any hope, this is a big question, of preventing central sensitization around those vulnerable people? So for yeah. highly sensitive people, can we move towards any kind of prevention of central sensitization? Uh, so uh, I'll presume that the question is um, after an insult, like a like a physical trauma or something like that, um, mm -hmm. tissue damage. Uh, yeah, I think there's absolutely hope because, and the reason I say that is that it's well established that there are a large number of adults with very sensitive protective systems, not not just in the pain realm, but in uh, responding to auditory like sounds mm -hmm. lights um immune threats there are people who's who have a naturally bigger buffer in general mm -hmm. to all of their protective feelings uh who don't have chronic pain but yeah. who have certainly sustained injuries so those though, there's many people like that so uh no i don't think yeah recognizing that you are a almost like an, an over responder by nature and by biology and all that um and if you sustain an injury that that doesn't mean you you're going to develop no. the changes within your nervous and immune system that we call central sensitization mm -hmm. um no it doesn't mean you'll develop that it does it probably does mean that you're at an elevated risk well it does mean you're at an elevated risk Right. Um, to be aware of that, maybe. Yeah, I guess all the more reason to dive into the irresistible force of healing and the need of our tissues to have mechanical forces going through them to mm -hmm. complete recovery. And some of that will involve uh, challenging yourself within the pain buffer, but just not mm -hmm. so far within it that you trigger all that flare up. Right. disabling right. distressing stuff yeah 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 well i think we've kind of come to the end of our our uh time here with you and i'm i'm going to go back and listen again and write those those four um steps out to to remember them and and send them out um to to people um is there anywhere um 
Lorimer, that people can go to learn more about those four, or that's not even come, that hasn't even been published yet. That's not published. And um, I'm not sure in what format that will be published because it was a, a distill, a distilling by mm. people who are not scientists and don't publish. Um, the, the core group is the group that has this virtual reality platform. Um, they're called Reality Health. Uh, okay. I have a conflict of interest in mentioning them because my wife bought $100 worth of shares in that company. Okay, thanks for the disclosure. <laughs> so, the, oh. um, but the wider concept, am I back? Yes. Yep. You're good. Can you hear me? I think I froze. The, the, the concepts that sit under those four uh, are part of Pain Revolution's target concept. So um, on the Pain Revolution website, I, I'm pretty sure there are fact sheets that are PDFs. Okay. Uh, That'd be helpful. They're in Australian. Uh, oh, although they're right. in speak Australian. We can, we can uh, figure that out. There, there are translations, not not into Canadian, but um, you know a few other languages. But yeah, we'll I'm just sure take you out all the mates. It. Take out the mates and the crikeys and the blimeys and <laughs> uh, all That's, that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, the cricket references, but they're all available for download. They're PDFs, and there's I, um, there's I think there's nine. They're called fact sheets. Okay, Is I will definitely look those I can up. I can do the cricket translation. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, you could actually. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Oh, thanks, just, Karen, was, for posting that. Sorry. I was just looking at the last Australia South Africa com uh, match last year. I, I, I think I think I could do a good translation for that. Probably. Oh, was that was that the um, the series in which Australia was was just shamed? Yeah, I think we won three zip on that one. Okay, I can <laughs> see where this conversation is going. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, All right. I want to really, uh, once again, thank you, uh, Professor Mosley, for being here with us today Absolutely. for, I can just see, you know, so many people have benefited here and so many more will um, be watching the recording and for all your work and your dedication in this field. I, mm -hmm. I feel like it, along with, I know many, many other people is really shifting, shifting the dial mm -hmm. uh, for all oh. people out there who live you know, with pain conditions. Um, well, thanks for having me. And, um, you know, congrats and kudos to you guys for what you do. I think it's, it's terrific. And you're part of the, you're part of the gradual solution. That's fabulous. But it's been a real pleasure to join you here. It's a rainy day in Adelaide. We are, we are heading for our coldest of the year, which you guys will think is very funny. It's at a maximum yeah. temperature of 13 degrees. Wow. Yes. We'd love, but that's very we'd, cold for us. We'd love some rain. We're in the middle of the Oof. biggest heat wave we've ever had. Oh, yeah, I've seen the it's terrible. Oh, it's terrible. Completely smoky yeah. out there right right now. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, as I look out the window, all I can see is is um, smoke. Mm -hmm. oh, it's horrible, isn't it? That, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, may that pass. May the rain return. And Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Lorimer, thank you very, very all much right. from uh, all it's of us. It's a pleasure. Take care. Thanks for having me. Have a good See day. Ya. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Good day.